Thank you very much. I hope everyone can hear me well. If not, uh, please send a chat out. Um, but um, thank you for attending today. We're going to talk about strategies to lower ownership costs for your street assets and the communities that you manage. Um, just a little bit about Holbrook Asphalt. Um, we have been in business since 1998. Um, in uh, 20. Uh, in 2000, we began um, developing uh, a product which we specialize in, which happens to be in the pavement preservation market. Um, it happens to be one of many different types of treatments which are very effective in preserving and extending the useful service life of asphalt pavements. Uh, it's known as a high density mineral bond in our industry. Um, we launched it in 2002 and this year is our 20th year. Um, our product is used in 24 states across the United States, from California to the Carolinas. We're in over 200 cities across the country. Um, our headquarters are in St. George, Utah. We have offices in Las Vegas. We have offices in Phoenix, satellite office in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, and of course, I am the regional director for Holbrook for the Southeast, but spend virtually all my time here in Florida. So. Um, with that, um, I want to tell you just a little bit about myself. I have been in the road building industry since the early 90s for 30 years now, since 92. Um, I've been uh, in pavement preservation for 23 years. I've been very fortunate to be involved in the design, um, development and application of a variety of different preservation treatments over the years. Um, what I've done over the past 23 years includes, uh, notwithstanding uh, developing some different products, but also teaching agencies uh, and industry across the country about pavement preservation and what is most effective based upon the condition, age, and uh, porosity, for example, of the existing asphalt pavements in their community and what treatments to best use and how they can get the most useful service life. Uh, over the years, I've been fortunate to sit on uh, several committees, uh, National Asphalt Pavement Association, uh, the National Road Research Alliance, um, uh, located up in Minnesota, um, and some other organizations, all of which um, have put a lot of uh, unique uh, think tanks together uh, in studies on preservation treatments to improve, again, useful service life of asphalt pavements, not just for industry, but also uh, for agency. Um, and we do a lot with communities and that's why we're here today. Um, I've been fortunate as well to uh, speak at uh, several conferences. Uh, most recently, the Kansas DOT Engineering and Transportation Conference uh, during the days of COVID, it was virtual, but uh, uh, we had over 300 members attending and they were uh, agency officials from uh, across the, uh, the Midwest. Um, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit about asphalt pavement. Uh, a lot of us don't pay much attention to the pavement other than driving on it. Um, unless of course we hit some ruts, uh, some potholes and, uh, and it starts affecting our pocketbook. If we have to, uh, remediate some repairs, uh, out of the cost of either our own pockets, uh, or, uh, through our associations. But asphalt essentially is 94% rock and 6% asphalt. Um, and the asphalt or asphalt binder, asphalt cement, there's a lot of different acronyms. Liquid AC, you'll have it referred to. But that 6% represents really the glue that holds all that rock together. Okay. Um, and at the bottom of the page, you'll see I've got a bullet point and I've got mixed designs. Um, there are hundreds, if not thousands of different mix designs um, that every DOT agency across the country has developed based upon their needs, based upon climate, based upon traffic loads. But it's important to point this out because what a mix design does is it enables the, um, the materials engineer to put together a very effective load bearing mixture of a variety of aggregates from fines, which are minus 200s and minus 400s, which is essentially a dust, to your sands, your grits, your smaller aggregates, your eighth inch up to quarter inch, three eighths and half inch aggregates. And there's a variety of percentages that go together. 
to form this asphalt mix, this matrix. And in that matrix, you have a certain percentage of air voids and you have a certain percentage of uh, asphalt binder, all of which to bring it together to be most effective under traffic loads. Um, and so what we see uh, going to the next uh, slide here, uh, everybody should be seeing slide four of 32. Um, we all wonder what causes asphalt to fail. Um, asphalt is known as a flexible pavement. Uh, concrete is known as a rigid pavement. Rigid pavements or concrete do two things. They get hard and they crack. Now with concrete in the industry, we control where it cracks. We put control joints every four feet on sidewalks, for example, and every 15 feet on the interstates or roadways that are paved with concrete. Asphalt as a flexible pavement uh, is a whole matrix of asphalt binder, rock, designed to achieve certain densities. And it's designed to flex based on temperatures, based on heaving of the ground, and based on freeze thaws, which we don't have here in Florida most of the time, unless you're up in the Tallahassee region and, and you'll see that sometimes. But um, what causes the asphalt to fail um, and, and it's inevitable, I want to point out, asphalt will never last forever. Um, and it's, it's inevitable that uh, the replacement will occur. Uh, it does degradate over time. It's accelerated by different climate conditions. If maintenance and proper preservation techniques are ignored, it does it a lot faster. Um, but the key to um, pavement preservation is stopping that oxidation. So you've all seen new asphalt go down. And what it does, it's nice and black and rich. Uh, a lot of times you'll smell the oils coming out of that. Um, it seems like maybe for about a month now, um, years ago when binder was different and refining technologies were not as advanced as they are today, you might go several months and smell those, those oils, those volatiles, if you will, coming out of that asphalt. And it would take a lot longer to white out and gray out. And you wouldn't see the top down cracking as frequently as you do with asphalts today. And I don't want to get too far off into the weeds, but, um, you know, asphalt is a byproduct of the refining process of crude oil. And it seems like crude oil seems to be in, in, in uh, the news and we're, we're paying a lot more attention to, to crude based upon um, uh, it being a fossil fuel, uh, what we use and consume in industry and as consumers and the price at the pump, but it does fluctuate. It is a commodity. But during the refining process, um, the refining technologies are so advanced today that when you go through, and I'm not going to mention everything, but when you start with crude and you start refining all the way down to the bottom of the barrel, you know, you've got your heavy oils, your gear oils, uh, you've got your motor oils, your lightweight oils, your household oils. Then you get to your fuels, your number two diesel, number one diesel, kerosene, gasoline, alcohol, jet fuel. And you go all the way down the process. When you get to the bottom of the barrel, if you will, the flux that's left over is the sticky resinous substance, the asphalt binder. And an excellent use is obviously to bind that rock together for flexible pavements. The problem is, is that refining technologies really over the past 15 years have become so advanced. They take so much of the good stuff out. The flux and the asphalt does not react very well to the environment, not like it did 15 years ago. And that's why on average, you'll see the DOT, especially on interstates with high traffic, excessive traffic loads, um, and a lot harsher climates than others. Uh, and not just here in Florida, um, but where you have a lot of freeze thaw, typically you'll see those roads being replaced every 10 to, uh, uh, eight to 10 years. And, and in warmer climates with the moisture we have, you're going to see that, um, on average of about every 15 or 16 years, um, sometimes sooner with some of the mixed designs, but essentially it oxidizes so quickly from the sun and from the air and the moisture intrusion affects its ability to withstand traffic loads and the climate. And most of what we see in communities, for example, because they don't have the traffic loads the interstate does and some of the state highways, but we see significant climate-related damage. And the significance 
uh, in um, in the mixed designs, and I'll get to that slide here in just a, in, in just a second. The significance is um, the first condition you would normally see is a condition called raveling, and that's the loss of bond between um, the asphalt binder and the fines and small aggregates in the asphalt mix because it becomes hard and brittle as it oxidizes. It whites and grays out and gets as hard as concrete. Um, but I'm on slide five of 32 now, and all this does is illustrate a typical uh, pavement curve, which um, most of us here in the industry and a lot of you, if you look at some reports um, on the effectiveness of different mixed designs and, and different asphalts, you'll see the degradation curve and the life. And on the left-hand side, you'll see zero to 100. That is noted as PCI, which is your pavement condition index, okay? Um, and a pavement condition index is the graph that you see to the right. Uh, it's color-coded, uh, good, satisfactory, fair, poor, very poor, um, and uh, failed and, and, um, uh, uh, and, and whatnot. Um, but what that does, that's a, um, that's a scale that was um, developed first by the Army Corps of Engineers back in the early 50s to, um, to monitor airfields. Uh, it was picked up in the early 70s by municipalities and is used widely today by a lot of pavement management groups, pavement managers such as myself when we're doing evaluations of the condition of streets. And essentially what that does is, is put a, a number on different street and categories based upon its condition. And it can range in age. It doesn't necessarily mean that a 14-year-old a pavement is any worse than a nine-year-old pavement. I've seen eight and nine-year-old pavements that are in worse condition than some 14 and 15-year-old pavements, uh, frankly. Um, but there's so much science and chemistry in asphalt and so many factors involved in the way that it's produced, the way that it's put down, the temperatures of which it's compacted, as to its long-term performance. But I wanted to show that graph uh, simply because what they show is you're going to drop to a, a 50 uh, pavement condition index or a 50 PCI at about that 16-year range. And most pavement managers will, will follow this graph because it's proven over a lot of monitoring, a lot of testing, uh, by a lot of academia over the years, um, your National Centers for Asphalt Technology at Auburn University, uh, also known as NCAT, which is one of the premier. Uh, in 2000, they developed a, I think it's a two and a half mile test track in Opelika, Alabama. And um, they have a multitude of sections on that. Um, does someone have a question? Uh, I thought I saw a marker come up. No, I, I don't hear anything and, and I don't see anything. So, um, okay. All right. I've got a, um, I had an indication there might be a question. Um, but also, uh, you know, Min Road up in Minnesota, the National Road Research Alliance um, Foundation for Pavement Preservation. There's a lot of agencies and a lot of organizations that have done a tremendous amount of testing on asphalt. And it helps us in the industry to understand form and function and be able to teach uh, folks like yourself and even agency individuals about this. And there happens to be a report and a lot of these reports I have, and I'll be happy to make them available. Um, so reach out either directly to myself uh, post uh, presentation um, or through Carrie, and I can make sure I get this information to you. Um, but this in the next slide, I'm going to just talk about um, the, uh, the life cycle of your asphalt binder. And again, asphalt binder, Essentially, there's a lot of science and a lot of chemistry, as I mentioned, but just to ease things up, you, you pretty much have two components, right? You've got asphaltines, which are your solids, and you have maltines or maltine fractions, which give you that oily resinous substance. And those are what evaporate and bake and oxidize so quickly and turn white and gray out. And they tend to um, sort of convert to asphaltines. And that's why your pavement... Uh, asphalt no longer becomes flexible, be, but becomes hard and begins to crack. You'll see a lot of top-down cracking. You start to see the deterioration. Um, and that occurs, and, and FP2 is one uh, organization that published a very interesting report on that, uh, as well as on the next slide, which is uh, Dr. Kandel 
who was a, a binder researcher for the National Center for Asphalt Technologies. But those two reports in particular show that the majority of your uh, loss of flexibility in your binder and loss of rheological properties of that binder uh, are done and occur in the, in the first four years of the asphalt's life. Um, so that's very important. And 90% of the oxidized asphalt is in that top three eighths layer of the asphalt. So you may have an inch and a half surface course. You may have a two inch or two and a half intermediate or base course, uh, for example, to give you uh, four, four and a half upwards of five inches of asphalt that you're riding on. But what is most critical is from the top down. It's just the very top surface, the riding surface of that asphalt that's most important for you to preserve. And it has much smaller aggregates, much finer aggregates, such as quarter inch and smaller to give you a smoother ride. Um, there's so many factors involved in designing. You're going to have a lot larger aggregate to give you much more stability on your intermediate and your base courses, for example. Um, so I, I spoke a little bit earlier, I'm on slide eight of 32, about the PCI. Um, the Army Corps, again, developed it in the 50s. Municipalities picked it up in the early 70s, and it's widely used today. And it's a very good gauge um, to uh, tell folks and to give recommendations on what type of treatments at what time in the pavement life cycle is most effective for you to extend that useful service life out many, many years. And most of what we see is that preservation treatments, and we're going to talk about all of them today, um, are generally best served for the asphalt uh, on those that score above a 70. Um, that doesn't mean that we haven't seen some asphalt pavements with a 67 to 69 PCI, where we have not been able to extend the useful service life out maybe another 10 years. And that might be enough to allow an association um, to reassess um, the road funds and reserves to get to that point where they would have to do the unfortunate inevitable and that's to replace that asphalt. Um, as you all know, you have, um, uh, and I'm not sure if there's another question or not. Um, Carrie, if uh, I'm not picking up any audio from you and I'm not sure if there's a question, I had an indication come up here on video. So um, if so, just uh, give me some sort of a signal. Let me see if there's something on chat. No. OK, I'm sorry, guys. Um, just double checking. I don't see anything. There's Carrie. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes. Okay, I think I'm in a major delay over here on my end, so I do apologize. If it comes to a point where you can't hear me, just say, stop, Carrie, we can't hear you. Stop talking to yourself. <laughs> um, okay, we have two questions that have come up. One is, um, does Holbrook Asphalt provide porous asphalt options? We'll let you get to answer that one. Uh, provide what, what options? I'm sorry. Porous asphalt options. Um. When you say porous uh, asphalt options, um, uh, give me a, a definition of that. Do you mean, um, uh, do we actually provide hot mix asphalt? Do we actually replace the asphalt itself? Uh, I don't know, John, tell me what you're talking about there. In the meantime, we'll see if we can answer Mitchell's questions. Um, oh, John said yes. Yes. Yeah, we, you know, you would think, and we get this a lot, well, Holbrook Asphalt, uh, where's your asphalt plant? Uh, so you guys provide asphalt. Um, unfortunately, we do not. Now, we will recommend a lot of uh, asphalt companies um, throughout Florida, um, uh, you know, to come in and do patchwork uh, and to repave. Um, but we ourselves do not. Uh, we specify and specifically do one thing very, very well. And uh, that is the product that we developed uh, and continue to, um, uh, to provide agencies and, and industry. Um, and that's the high density mineral bond. So we, we, we don't okay. do that. Uh, the other question we had was how has inflation and the cost of crude affected the price of asphalt installation? I don't know if you would know that answer. 
speak. Well, I do. Uh, and, and that's a good question, especially now. It's very timely. Um, very good question. So, um, you know, we always try to get price ranges when we do a, an orientation uh, in an education seminar to a group of board members and or property managers. Um, and so, for example, um, everything has kind of risen in proportionate ratio to each other. We, uh, you know, um, uh, rejuvenators are about a third of the cost of asphalt replacement. Um, high density mineral bond is, is slightly more above that, but still about a, a quarter of the cost. Uh, I'm sorry, slightly above a third, but less than a half. Um, and then we'll also look at micro and uh, surfacing and, and, and slurries, which are also effective treatments that can be used. Um, and those might range to give you an idea, um, anywhere from maybe uh, $3 to maybe $4 a yard, as opposed to what we see in asphalt today, um, is about uh, $10 to $10 plus per yard for an overlay. But a mill and resurface, which is generally done more often than not, so we can maintain ADA, and also maintain inverts for stormwater drainage in communities with uh, stormwater design, including uh, curb and gutter, for example, or even the inver inverted crowns in the middle. But you have to maintain an invert, so they would have to mill out an inch and a half and then resurface it at that same thickness. And we're seeing 14 uh, to almost $15 a yard, for example. So uh, that gives you a pretty good idea, I hope. Thank you. You bet. Um, so I'm going to jump to slide 10. Um, this is a, a photograph of a very heavily raveled surface. So, you know, to go back uh, 12, 15 minutes ago when I was talking about mixed designs, the reason why I wanted to talk about that is because what you're going to see that comes out of the surface first, once that asphalt binder oxidizes, it whites, uh, whites out, it grays out, it becomes hard and brittle is when you have traffic loads and the torquing of the tires and you combine that with rainfall and moisture intrusion, it accelerates the process of those fines and sands and small aggregates coming loose from that asphalt matrix and rolling out. Many of you, I, you've already done it. You'll probably go out and, and, and look at your, uh, maybe one, one, one or more of your communities uh, a little bit closely, but you can put your fingers down and rub on the surface and you can feel the grits that consistently come out. Cul-de-sacs tend to show it the worst simply because you have a lot of slow turning, torquing motion with vehicles, um, but you'll also see it very heavily at intersections and in some locations on even some straight runs in the wheel lanes. Um, but this is a rather significant um, uh, condition uh, known as raveling, and that's what you typically see before you see top-down cracking unless there's a base failure or unless it's on a longitudinal joint, which is where, um, you know, two different passes on the same street come together. One is done, say, on a Monday. The other is done, say, on a Tuesday. And uh, there's a, a difference of anywhere from 10 to 15 percent on compaction densities on the first layer you put down because, you know, normally they're compacting asphalt pavement, which is made at 350 degrees at the plant, normally hits the, the paver and is placed on the road at about 300 degrees. Um, and usually they begin compacting around 295, 296. Um, and when you have an unconfined edge, they tend to stay away from that until it cools uh, down to the low 200s. And then they'll get in there and they'll compact that so it doesn't smush out of the way, right? Um, but that represents uh, 10, 11, 13 percent uh, density uh, uh, difference. So you might have an 83 percent compaction density. And on the second layer you do on Tuesday, because now you've got a hard confined edge to come up to on the other side, you're compacting everything and you're doing it at temperature. So you get up to a 94, 95 percent compaction density. Well, that's a difference that 10 to, to 12 percent, for example, is like water in a sponge that water will penetrate that lower density um, piece of asphalt right next to that longitudinal joint, or sometimes referred to as a cold seam. And it will allow that water to penetrate. And that's why when you drive down the road and sometimes in your own communities where the center line stripe is uh, on, the, on public streets, you'll tend to see that joint and you'll specifically see it on interstates where it begins to separate before everything else. And that's one of the reasons why. And it's just very difficult to get joint densities on that first pass for that reason. 
But I wanted to show that because uh, we typically see this on uh, PCIs that uh, in these particular areas are under a 65. Um, next slide uh, shows some cores uh, as an example. Um, these particular cores um, were pulled from uh, a community, a series of communities that we worked in. Um, these cores were pulled in 2011. Uh, the pavement was installed in uh, 99 on both the uh, core to the left and the center core, and in 95 on the core all the way to the right. And the relevance of this, um, uh, this particular slide is on the core all the way to the left, it's a slurry type 2. And so a slurry seal and a microsurface are very, very similar. We're going to talk about that in a minute and I'll illustrate how those are installed and how effective they are as a paper preservation tool, which they are. Um, but uh, slurry is a different term, but the products are almost the same. The type one, two, and three are based upon different aggregate sizes. So for example, type one is eighth inch aggregate. Type two is a quarter inch aggregate. Type three is um, a three inch aggregate, for example. Okay. And uh, this one in this particular core was installed in 2007. Um, and the core was pulled uh, four years after that. Now, those are effective treatments. Um, and they typically will last anywhere from seven to nine years. But they are an asphalt treatment. And they still have eight to 10% air voids, which still allow water to penetrate and come through. It also allows the oxygen to continue and come through. And it does oxidize and continue to degradate the asphalt even below the new treatment that you put on. The chip seal in the middle, uh, typically you'll put uh, an asphalt emulsion down. It's usually uh, what's called an RS. Uh, there's various number designations, but that stands for rapid setting. And so the emulsion goes down, a, um, a truck uh, comes along and drops aggregate out in front, usually nine and a half millimeter or three eighths and smaller. And then another uh, rubber tire vehicle comes over and compresses it. You won't see those type of applications. Uh, you shouldn't ever in a community because they're noisy. They're very porous. They're inexpensive and they work great for county roads, um, but not for our communities. But that's what we had available. And we used it as a demonstration because um, this one was installed uh, in 2008, which is nine years after the pavement was installed. Um, core all the way to the right happens to have a high density mineral bond on it. Um, and the relevance of that core is that seven years later, we did um, a first high density mineral bond on that. And in 2008, six years later, we put a second coat on. But what I want to point out is that because a high density mineral bond has the ability to stop water intrusion. It is completely impervious to moisture. And that's what's so unique about this as opposed to some of the other treatments is that it will stop water dead in its tracks. It'll also starve the existing asphalt from oxygen oxidation, from the air oxidizing that. It just blocks everything. Uh, and again, it's very, very durable. Um, and again, I see, I think there might be another question coming up. And if there's a delay, um, when I see you pop in, Carrie, I'll, I'll stop. Um, but the relevance here, if you look at the core, you can see how the binder still maintains its original dark color and you can see it visibly. And that's what's nice about these cores um, without having to do a breakdown and extraction and separate the rock and look at the binder and, and uh, run viscosity tests um, and, um, and what's called the phase angle, which is uh, uh, to determine how much is viscous and how much is elastic. You can see it physically. Um, so that's, that's the relevance of, uh, of this core. Um, so let's talk about um, the preservation treatments that are available. Some of you may have had some experience, may be, um, have used some of these other treatments. Uh, they include rejuvenators. Uh, they include premium seal coats, microsurfacing and slurry seals. I just spoke to a little bit, a high density mineral bond. And then, of course, we'll talk about the mill and resurface of uh, um, utilizing uh, new hot mix asphalt. Um, so those are, you know, the proverbial tools in the toolbox. And those are a lot of options for you to consider. And they're, they're priced uh, different from one another. 
And so um, I can give you ranges just to kind of give you an idea, but Rejuvenator Technologies, uh, they've been around for uh, five decades now, all right? Um, the price is kind of low on the scale, uh, which makes it uh, affordable for agencies uh, and also uh, some communities if they choose to, to put a Rejuvenator on. Um, the payment extension is, is pretty good. It works, uh, three out of five stars, if you will. Um, public acceptance is two out of the five stars. Um, they are comprised of asphalt-based or petroleum-based chemistries and also plant-based uh, or bio-based chemistries. And both chemistries work. They work a little bit differently uh, than the other, um, but they can be very effective. And most of these treatments will give you a two to three year life extension, uh, for example. Um, and so on the next slide, I'm on 14 to 32, um, rejuvenators are applied through a computer or GPS controlled truck. Uh, there's applied rates, uh, and design rates. Um, virtually all of your, um, pavement preservation treatments are, um, uh, um, are, are defined as uh, being applied in tenths of a gallon per square yard. So for example, rejuvenators, you're going to see anywhere from maybe a 0.04 tenth of a gallon per square yard up to maybe a 0.15 or a 0.16 uh, gallons per square yard. And that gives you a range of, of um, uh, a variety of of uh, application rates based upon what the asphalt needs, how old it is, what it needs. And, and then there's also some uh, standards that were developed by the FAA, uh, specifically specification number 632, which is the gold standard uh, for how rejuvenators uh, need to perform. Um, and that's a reduction by 40% of your viscosity within the first 90 days. Uh, I'm sorry, within the first 30 to 45 days for pavements older than three years old, newer than three years old, it's a 25% reduction in that same time period. And in order to do that, you have to take cores uh, out of the, uh, the treated area. And uh, those cores need to be sent off to a lab and extractions need to occur in order for you to watch how that viscosity recovers. Um, so I, I got that. I'm not sure if you guys could hear that. I'm not sure if someone's trying to chime in. Let me just see if, uh, no, I really don't see any. I'm sorry, guys. I keep looking for questions or, or chats. Um, but um, uh, just a little bit uh, a little bit more about Rejuvenator Research and CAT, um, of which you heard me speak of earlier, just concluded a three and a half year study, first began back in November of 2018 on Rejuvenators. They use petroleum-based, plant-based, and a resin product in which they wanted to check the effectiveness on asphalt pavements. Um, the petroleum were put on a six-year-old pavement, the plant-based and the resinous uh, product was put on an eight-year-old pavement at the time, now three and a half years older. But what they do uh, is they have done a, a full research cycle. Each research cycle is uh, three years. Um, and, um, it involves a variety of different mixed designs, uh, most of which are all surface mixed designs, which are all very conducive to what we have here in Florida, for example. So it gives you a good idea of their effectiveness. And the long and short of it is um, their research and testing has determined that rejuvenators, uh, the effectiveness of a rejuvenator will give you two and a half to three years before you have to reapply. And basically when you apply a rejuvenator, you're knocking a, I'll just use for round numbers, you're knocking a, a 50,000 viscosity down to say a 14,000 viscosity. But over time that will recover and work its way back up. And two and a half to three years later, you'll get right back up to where you were pre-treatment, post-treatment, which will be at 50,000 visc, and then you have to reapply it again. And that is one treatment that you can reapply. But one thing about rejuvenators is it's like um, I, I guess a good way to define it is like, it's like uh, butter on toast. Okay. It's designed to penetrate the existing asphalt. Um, it's designed to give you, uh, depth, um, and, and preservation up to three eighths of an inch, uh, deep from the surface. Um, 
And so it's, it's, it's like butter on toast, as opposed to premium seal coats, for example, in even high density mineral bond, that's more like a peanut butter on bread. It has no penetrating component. It's not designed to soften the existing binder and drive rejuvenating chemistry down in. It's designed to starve the asphalt from the environmental hazards, which are sunlight, oxygen, and water uh, to preserve its life. So there's different technologies, um, but they do all work, but at different degrees. They all have their limits. Um, seal coating, many of you are familiar with, uh, um, with a lot of associations. Uh, it is very affordable. Um, it's low on the price scale. Uh, the payment extension is two out of five stars. Um, you know, there's a lot of studies out there. Uh, TTI, Texas A&M, the, the Texas Transportation Institute, uh, has done a lot of uh, testing on on seal coatings ability for pavement preservation, and uh, it's very short term. Uh, it is it, it is effective for smaller communities um, and some commercial applications where they do want to keep the the asphalt uh, looking aesthetically pleasing. But uh, the pavement preservation uh, ability of seal coats uh, are just not uh, equal to, and they just don't add up to those that are available uh, that we're talking about. And we're going to talk about more here uh, in just a short. And, and a lot of times what you'll see is usually in two and a half to three and a half years, you're going to see significant fading. Um, and most premium seal coats have a substantial amount of water. Uh, it's generally 40% or more water. And that's why you see that. It's kind of a, uh, like, a like a watercolor uh, versus an oil painting. It's just thinner. Uh, and again, it, it too does not wear very well as it pertains to the climate and traffic loads. Um, but that's typically what you see. Um, but again, they're, they're, they're very low on the cost scale. You might see on average anywhere from maybe a dollar to maybe a dollar 50 per square yard. Um, that's what I see on average. Uh, there could be some more, there could be some less, but that kind of should give you an idea on seal coating. Now, slurry seals, we talked a little bit about that already. Um, you know, the price is about midway. It's about three out of six stars, for example, uh, or, or halfway up the scale, I'm sorry. Pavement extension is three out of five stars. Uh, it's good. You can get seven, eight, sometimes nine years out of it, but it depends on the application and it depends on what you do. Um, slurries and micros have the ability uh, to build structure. Um, rejuvenators do not build structure. Um, they don't fill ruts. Uh, high density mineral bond does not uh, build structure. But um, slurries and micros and double micros um, are very effective in building structure, primarily for county administrations and, and municipalities and public works, uh, works directors, because where you have, say, on a on a minor collector, you've got 6,000 cars a day and a lot of traffic lights, that downward friction, you end up seeing a lot of rutting. And um, that's a very effective treatment on these type of uh, roadways because it can fill those ruts and level it up. And typically how it's done uh, is, a, um, uh, is through a self-contained vehicle with an emulsion, the aggregate, it goes through an auger down into a sled, which is where numbers eight and nine are. And it's simply, uh, skim coated along the surface at a particular depth. And that's usually what you're going to see. Can you uh, hear me, Steve? I got you now. Yes. Okay. I dialed in. Okay. All right. So we had a question come up and Jared wants to know, is a rejuvenator application better used for a road installed only three years previously, like a new development or for an older community nearing the life expectancy of the asphalt in the reserve schedule? So we'll start that. That's so there's a great, more to that question, but I'll let you answer that. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and thank you for that. So, yes, in a perfect world, you want to apply an asphalt rejuvenator as quickly as you can on a new asphalt pavement. Ideally, in the first five years, if you can do it in the first year and a half to two years, it's perfect. Now, you're going to adjust those application rates because you don't need as much. I have found that rejuvenators, and so is, uh, you know, many, many studies. Uh, NCAT, the National Road Research Alliance with, with Minroad, which is in Minnesota, is doing a rejuvenator study as well, although a different climate up there in Minnesota. Um, but they're not as effective on older pavements because there's very little there 
as opposed to when it's new to try to rejuvenate. Uh, it's just too old. Um, so you're much better to get on a newer asphalt pavement. Um, but I will say that most people look at you like you've got two heads. They say, now, wait a minute, <laughs> this is brand new asphalt. It looks great. Uh, we just spent X amount of dollars putting this down two years ago. Um, what do you mean I have to spend more money and put a treatment on it? Well, now begins the education process, the continuing education, explain to them, yeah, but we want this to last 35 years. We don't want to replace this in 20. So, um, you know, uh, so, so that's a very good question. But Carrie, go ahead with, uh, with the other, please. Well, and, I, and you did answer the rest of it, but he asked, so if every three years you would come back and apply the rejuvenator, how often are we going to, once we do the rejuvenator, how many years before we have to come back and do another application for budget purposes is what he's trying to find out. Okay. So to give you an idea, um, when you put a rejuvenator down, um, before you put the rejuvenator down on a pavement, um, what you want to do is you're going to take cores of the non-treated area, and then you're going to take cores post-treatment. And you're going to send those cores. It's typically three six-inch cores are required to send off to a lab and, and uh, you know, I, I have no affiliation with, uh, no ownership in, I don't know if I'm supposed to disclose this, but PRI and ATS are both excellent labs here in Florida. Um, they do a phenomenal um, uh, job at, at testing um, the radiological properties of binder. Um, they do a great job uh, with uh, uh, extracting cores and, uh, and, and uh, evaluating those. But you have to do that. You need at least three, six inch cores to get enough binder to do the testing. And, but you have to do that once a year. Um, you, you just can't look at the surface of an asphalt and say, yeah, you know, I bet I can go another two or three years. No, you know, you give the asphalt what it needs when it needs it. On average, it's about every two and a half to three years. It could extend out to four years before you have to do it. Uh, it could be two years when you have to do it. But in order to do that, you have to pull cores every year. You have to send them off to a lab. And you could be looking at, you know, uh, anywhere from maybe 3,000 to, to 3,500 to have those cores analyzed each year. Um, you've got holes that you have to fill uh, with asphalt every time you do a core, but the only way to really keep up with it and know exactly when to put it down is to pull cores annually and, and to send them off to a lab and test them. So is the rejuvenator the same as pavement dressing conditioner? So PDC uh, is a uh, coal tar based uh, rejuvenator. Um, and um, uh, so, yes, it, it is a rejuvenator. It has uh, penetrating components or cutters within that will dissolve and soften the existing binder uh, on an aged and oxidized road. And it will uh, help drive that chemistry down in there to work whatever magic that formulation uh, is designed to do. Okay. Well, that's it for questions for right now. But if you guys have more, please keep posting them. No, great questions. Thank you. So, again, on a slurry, uh, because of the size of aggregate, and that's eighth-inch aggregate, that's typically what you're going to see. I've seen this in a couple communities, but you're, you probably wouldn't put it in yours because of what it looks like. Um, and again, it's not, you typically don't see the redding. Um, and if there's any significant um, formation of potholes um, or significant uh, loss of bond on longitudinal joints or cold seams, you're going to do a patch or replace that, for example. And again, micros, a little bit more expensive because they're a little bit more refined. You know, a good micro is going to get you seven, eight years. Um, but again, um, uh, it is an asphalt treatment. Uh, it does have eight to 10 percent air voids. You're going to see it tear up in, in about three years in cul-de-sacs because it just cannot withstand the slow, twisting, turning motion of vehicles. I mean, from your heaviest, your, your waste vehicles, your garbage trucks, uh, you know, just to your, your SUVs and, and the sports cars that are turning around in there. Um, it's, you know, you still have to give some consideration to traffic loads and the type of treatment that you put in and the slow turning, twisting, torquing motion of vehicle tires, uh, will tend to delam and, and, and rake those up. You'll see it first in cul-de-sacs. Um, but again, uh, it is an option for you. Uh, it just won't stop water intrusion. And what I see the most in, um, climate related damage is that the water accelerates that, uh, loss of fines and continued degradation and loss of rock, which gives you that stability. But again, uh, this is great. This is a great product. 
uh, in filling ruts and adding structure, which so many others cannot do. So that's something to think about. But again, lots of different studies. Uh, the Center for Transportation Research uh, at um, uh, Austin, uh, University of Texas in Austin, a great study on that. Um, I want to move on to uh, high density mineral bond. Uh, again, about halfway through uh, the cost structure, pavement extension, four out of five stars, uh, public acceptance is five out of five stars. Um, you know, this is uh, a petroleum emulsion. Uh, there's no tar or coal tar uh, and no environmental, uh, environmentally hazardous products um, that are in that component. Um, it is applied very similar to a rejuvenator. It's an engineered product. It's designed to go down at a specific rate where it can be most effective. Um, high density mineral bonds are a two coat process. Um, where I talked about rejuvenators, um, the way their formulations and the effectiveness of their chemistry may only require them to put down as little as a 0 0.05 gallons per square yard or up to a 0.16 gallons per square yard. A high density mineral bond will go down at a 0.36 gallons per square yard, and that's after the second code. Uh, so each code is roughly about a 0.18, and there are GPS and computer controlled trucks, which have spray bars on the back. Um, and that's how they're typically applied uh, to the existing surface. And if there's any cracks that need to be filled, um, they should be filled ahead of time. Uh, and uh, it's always recommended to use a hot melt crack fill material, which is most effective in filling those cracks that are quarter inch and larger. Um, high density mineral bond is viscous enough to where it's gonna naturally fill those eighth inch and hairline cracks. So you're not out there with a wand and, and, a, and a melter, uh, you know, chasing cracks uh, to the tune of, of 20,000 lineal feet down the street. Um, it's only the larger, the quarter inch cracks that you want to fill to stop that moisture from getting down to the base and giving you much larger problems and contributing to base failure, um, which is which can be very expensive. Um, and again, it's, uh, it is applied, all those trucks have hand wands. So if there's some cut-ins to do, if there's a small parking lot to do around the clubhouse or around the pool, um, typically the, uh, the crews will take the, the hose wand off and they'll go ahead and apply it by hand and they'll protect, um, the stand-up curbs and curb and gutter and, and, uh, keep it only on the asphalt, not on the concrete. Um, uh, this is a photograph of, of, of one um, that was done in Fort Pierce um, in November of this past year. And the relevance in showing you this is because as a property manager, um, you understand the importance of getting the most value out of the money that you spend. So the mechanical benefit in useful life extension of your asphalt is more important. But a secondary benefit is having a very nice aesthetic appeal for a very, very long time, because that's what the majority of the residents see. They want it looking brand new 24-7, 365. And there's very little treatments which will allow you to do that just based upon how they're made. Um, and a high density mineral bond is just that. It uses a very fine uh, aggregate. Um, and when I say aggregate, it's not your typical aggregate that you find that's added to seal coats um, and that's added to uh, slurries and micros. Uh, this is a slate and it's a refined corundum and it's a very, very fine mesh. It's almost like a, the finish is almost like an 80 grit sandpaper. So it's very consistent in density and it's very consistent um, in, um, uh, in size. Uh, and in mesh. Um, and it, uh, it, it just provides a very, very good bond that wheels will not degradate out. It's small enough to where it's not going to roll those sands and fines out with the, the, the very small turning torquing motion that the vehicles do. And so the relevance in this, you can see this is relatively new. If I go on to the next slide, this is one that's four years old that was done in Vero Beach. Um, and it's in a community called Laurel Point. Um, if there's anybody in the area that wants to drive up there, for example, or drive to, to any of these, uh, I think I can probably provide some addresses. But the relevance of this is just because this is four years old, it still looks like it was done just a couple of months ago. So 
Yes, there are some very effective treatments that will give you the mechanical benefit and they range in cost um, for pavement preservation, right? To extend that life. But if you're wanting the value add for your community to give you that additional pop and to give you that, um, that aesthetic uh, value, um, I've not seen anything perform better than a high density mineral bond. Um, and, uh, and even hot mix asphalt, which there's really nothing better. I mean, we ride on hot mix asphalt, but you know, it'll very quickly turn white and gray out as you well know, because it oxidizes so quickly. Um, but this is just an example of the secondary benefit, uh, that you'll see. And I, I think I may have said this before, and I don't mean to, 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 to repeat myself too much on this, but, um, you know, the most, one of the most expensive pieces of infrastructure uh, that you have in your budget when it comes time to replace is going to be your asphalt. You know, pools are very expensive. Those of you that manage condominiums, if you got to replace a roof, oh my gosh, those are very expensive. Landscaping, uh, very expensive. Um, but you know, to replace streets, um, uh, you know, extremely expensive. Um, probably your most expensive piece of infrastructure that you'll have to deal with. Um, but there's a lot of performance data promoting um, the use of varying treatments, um, rejuvenator studies, uh, micros, high density mineral bond, uh, studies on permeability, which are critically important. If you have a treatment that will bead water uh, and stop water from penetrating um, for a five year period, I mean, absolutely not yet let any water intrusion in. Uh, the HDMB or high density mineral bond is very effective at that. And even out to eight years, which is typically the reapplication time for a high density mineral bond, we average, uh, we see an average of about eight years uh, here in Florida. Um, even after that point, there's a fraction of a percent of water that actually gets through that still at that time period. So um, very important uh, to understand um, uh, the durability of the products that you put on and are you going to be able to stop a water intrusion because you know i've said this before the the elements we need to survive on this planet as humans uh sunlight air and water are detrimental to asphalt uh, they would just they would just accelerate um the degradation of that uh, uh of that asphalt structure uh very very quickly and unless you're just uh you know, flowing in money. Um, you know, you don't want to replace this every 20 or 22 years. That's for sure. And we, we talked a little bit about um, new asphalt. Uh, when it comes time to totally do a, um, a rehabilitation, um, you know, the price is very high um, and it is what it is. It's, it's, uh, it's driven by, it's driven by, uh, crude price, oil prices. It's driven by crude refinery, uh, it, it just everything. And, um, uh, it is, um, it is effective, but if you can, uh, if you can preserve that, the key is when it comes time to do this, it's so, it, it's so difficult to be able to convince the board members that yes, we just spent $1 million or 500,000 or 2.1 million on replacing this. And those numbers will be that high. Um, it's, it's very, very difficult to convince a board to say, yeah, you're right. Let's go spend another 150,000 on it and let's preserve it with this treatment. Uh, people are going to look at you and say, why? It looks brand new. We just spent all this money. No, we're not going to spend that money. But it's a constant education to say, look, if you don't spend the money, if you can look downrange 30, 35 years, if you do this about every eight years um, with some treatments, every three years with others, if you so desire to do that, um, then we can avoid the inevitable here in 20 or 22 years. We can easily push this out to 35 years. Now, there's some studies that have shown um, that uh, the trend can easily go out to 40 years and beyond. But I'm very comfortable, based on my experience in this industry, saying you could easily get 35 years if you get on with the right treatment at the right time uh, with these asphalt pavements. So um, with that, uh, there's some contact information uh, on there for myself. I see Carrie popping on, so hopefully she comes through in a minute. I'm sure there might be some more questions here before we conclude. Can you hear me now? I have you now. Thank you. <laughs> I'm the Verizon guy. Okay. Um, you know, I was going to say, think how savvy the managers are going to look now when they come out and go, okay, we, gotta, we, we need to redo the asphalt. So we're going to have to do either 
an overlay or we're going to have to totally pull everything up, mix and mill it, and redo it. And if you just incorporate something like this into the whole budget process when you're presenting it to the board, then you've crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's as a manager to do what you should do to preserve the property, to the aesthetics and everything. So I think it's a good good option to add at the end of every proposal. So instead of just saying, okay, we're going to do the asphalt, let's go ahead and tack on this at the end so that we'll know this is a second step. It's not, it is optional, but this is why, you know. And, um, and then bring, you know, somebody like Steven that does these types of products and um, it, I think it just makes you look really good as a manager when you're you're bringing this kind of stuff to the board. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, did you guys have any more questions? Got a couple of people saying great stuff, Steve. Oh, thank you. I have put um, I have put a contact over in the chat. I put uh, in uh, the pin to the top his link. So if you wanted to reach out to him directly on Cam Matrix and send him a message, you can. And, you know, if you want to get him to come out and speak to anybody at your property, I know a lot of times it's hard to explain this stuff to a board. You almost need somebody like Steve to come out and talk to them, you know, because there's going to be so many questions. It's hard for um, somebody just sitting through a one-hour class to answer everything. So um, I do want you guys to make sure that you take advantage of that. And um, it looks like it's, it's uh, there's no questions coming in. How, would you like to close out, Steve? Uh, yeah, no, I, I just want to thank everybody for attending. Um, I would like um, uh, just to make sure uh, because I need to get uh, the, uh, certificates out to everybody. I need to go online at DBPR and uh, I think that uh, I need to upload um, uh, yep. the individuals by name, their license numbers, all that. So if I can just make sure that uh, I either get that through you, Carrie, uh, that would be great. You okay, perfect. Yeah, well, actually, this is a good this is a good time for me to explain to the managers how we do this. So whenever you guys attend a class on Cam Matrix, what I do is after the class, I get an analytic report from our um, site here that we're using that shows us everyone that registered and when they and if they attended. And when you attend, it shows how long you've been online, uh, if you attended the whole course versus just five minutes, whatever it was. And I upload that and send that over to Steve, and then he can go on to DBPR. He, if our presenters are responsible for uploading these. Uh, Cam Matrix can't do it because it's their it's their provider number and everything. So, Steve, how how quickly do you guys get these uploaded once we send all that information over to you? I'll get it as as quickly as I can. I think I'm required to do it. Um, thirty gosh, days. To, uh, how how many? You need to get it done within thirty days. But I know a lot of the managers will be checking within a week to see. <laughs> Yeah. there because I always get somebody go, Mike's not showing up yet. <laughs> right. No, and I want to get it done as quickly as possible. So uh, I want to try to get it done within three to five days, right? Um, just because okay. I don't want to get backed up. Um, and, and it happens. So, no, I want to get on it pretty quick. For some reason, I thought that maybe they had changed uh, when I spoke with them uh, a few months back. I thought that they had said that, uh, boy, we'd really like you to get get it done within a week. But and maybe that was it. But yeah, really? 30 days might be the mandate. But but I'll get it done just well, as quickly be. as possible. So it could have changed, and I don't know it. Uh, you know, and and we're getting so close to renewal time. It's just it's just crazy. Mm -hmm. Sal says, Sal, chat with me in Cam Matrix if you're not getting credit for the last class that you attended here on Cam Matrix, and I will uh, copy you in an email to the presenter and we'll figure out what's going on. We'll make sure that you're getting credit for it. Um, thank you. I want to thank everybody that attended today. I'd like to thank Steve for bringing this to the table. This is great information, something new, something different. And um, if you guys need anything, you can always reach out to him or to me on Cam Matrix. And we hope that you have a wonderful week and a great summer. And um, Jared said, yes, thank you. Info very helpful. We appreciate it. And we appreciate you guys. We appreciate the managers for all they do. This is manager uh, association manager month, appreciation month. So thank you guys. And y'all have a blessed day. You do the same. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all again very much for attending. Happy to assist. Uh, just reach out. Help you any way I can. Thank you, Karen.